they are uh, commemorating the azadi ka utsav in terms of 75 years or of our independence and a journey as how we are going forward so in this we have i would like to share that we have done almost 30 seminars and as we are moving forward while our focus is on waste re and also on uh, sustainability i feel that we have more and more to learn and more and more to deliberate we have also tried to connect with experts for you know the commitment of our uh, government and our country for meeting the goals of net zero so today we are have a very uh, you know renowned speaker and the topic which we are going to discuss is sustainability this is a buzzword now and everybody is talking about it i remember when i was doing the ipcc report we spent full one day on defining what is suspend sustainability so because you know sustainability is something which has a very holistic approach it it is not only environmental health but it also touches touches on other aspects social aspects eco economic aspects we have to consume that much which we can you know we require not for our greed but for our need and then we have to leave for the future generations also so that they can also not exploit it but use the resources as per their requirement so just to add a bit i think uh, i should not say more because we have a very renowned expert we have a person who's been working in this field for the last i can say a stalwart in this sector and uh, the sdgs are also all about we have sustainable goals you know 17 sdg sdgs by un and there also it is an all over development it is not the environment that you should just improve the environment reduce the emissions but it is an all over uh, uh, you know commitment we have to reduce poverty we have to reduce hunger we have to educate all we have to even reduce the gender gaps that also become a part of the entire sustainability practice we in skill council are really working in a very concerted manner to take forward these principles of sustainability today we are very fortunate to have mr niranjan khatri with us who is an expert in the renowned expert in the sector of sustainability and this is almost for a period of more than 3 decades he has a background of a hotel management and he also has been the ex cm ex general manager for the environmental initiatives in the itc hotels you know when i was reading about him i came to know so many things which i was not aware he has developed the you know, eco rating system eco designing system and then this eco rating has been distributed or applied to 1200 schools in delhi he has been the you know he has headed the cii renewable energy cell then of course with delhi government he has been on the power power uh, council the water council and i know he is very active in the water sector also which is a very important aspect of sustainability he has been chairman for sustainable development committees for hospitality sector this this is one area where i find any article i read in fact there is a um, newsletter which is coming on the hoteliers or the hospitality sector where he is regularly contributing he is also he has also written a lot of articles he has written a lot of you know he has organized a lot of conferences i don't have words to describe him it's beyond me to describe him and he has not only this he has got many awards you know excellent for his excellent work like the helen keller award karamveer puraskar green hoteler award you know parivartan sustainability so leadership award so he is such a renowned and a such a stalwart and we are happy to he be here and i want to share that we were lucky to have mr nirjan khatri with us for almost 5 years in skill council and he gave us so much guidance for developing our qualification packs our nosses you know for the green construction waste management carbon sinks you know and there was a collaboration he had uh, you know put forward with the gbci with the rotary club and there also there was a lot of interaction with the members with the students and so we, i i have i said i have i'll be short of words in describing him currently i found i found him that he is the founder and consultant with i sambhav this is also one Uh, organization which is uh, in which he is involved very actively and i think he will tell us more this organization 
interacts with uh, st uh, students, with educational institutions, government, so that they these people can be taught, trained how to have systems, you know, sustainability practices in their system. So, Mr. Khatri, with this, I would request, but before that, I will ask Dr. Saxena to kindly welcome him and also, you know, we can go through the association we had, the lovely association we had with him when he was in a skill council. Over to Dr. Saxena, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Dhamija. In fact, you have almost uh, covered the entire thing. <coughs> I would like to personally welcome uh, uh, Mr. Niranjan Khatri, who has been a, a, a very big support to Skill Council for Green Jobs. He has been our advisor in sustainability. And in, in fact, uh, we have... Uh, physically work with him on various uh, small projects. I will not take much time. In fact, uh, my heartiest welcome to Mr. Niranjan Khatri and maybe we would like to touch base uh, uh, towards the end of his uh, speech. Uh, 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 Mr. Khatri, please. Yeah, please. Mr. Khatri, you please. So thank you very much and Namaskar to all. <clears throat> So as Dr. Damija said, uh, <clears throat> the subject today is steering business towards sustainability. It's not moving. Well, uh, I was very privileged to be posted in Kalapani in 1988. Uh, Kalapani is also known as Port Blair because those days many stakeholders used to call this punishment posting. But uh, for me, it was a life-changing posting and uh, I learned a lot on sustainable development in, uh, in geographical isolation and uh, intuitively saw planetary boundaries in what we were doing and got to the journey of uh, changing our systems and processes to become resource efficient. So my presentation flow line is as follows, how it all started, uh, how we got into extended produ producer responsibility, then how we phased off CFC when it was not uh, required. We got into compensatory depository of forestation. We started an environment museum and we got into triple bottom line without knowing this terminology. And here's a quick view of the hotel from the sea if you're going in a boat. And this is the view of the uh, entrance to the harbor, very beautiful view. And our hotel was on top of a hill. And uh, we had a lot of uh, infrastructural challenges out there. There were only two flights per week those days. Today, I believe there are eight or 10 flights per day. And shipping schedule was once in 30 days. And if the weather packed up, we used to forget the taste of onions and potatoes. And telephone was very archaic those days. Lines was not very good. And of course, there was no internet. It was the only five-star hotel in the islands and was a managed property those days. And a lot of high-profile people stayed with us. And uh, a month after I settled down in the hotel, I got a call from the late commander in chief of Navy, Admiral Govil. And uh, he said, Niranjan, will you please do something about your uh, cardboard passenger box? They're lying all over the island. This is all he said. And uh, naive and foolish that I was at that time, without thinking, I said, yes, sir. And I did nothing. And again, a month later, I get a call from the conservator of forests with a similar request that, look, uh, you guys get 50,000 tourists and I've got seven people to look after tw uh, 200 square kilometers. Uh, and the tourists are messing up the islands; They're breaking the corals. Please do something about it. And again, foolishly, I told him, yes, I'll do something about it. And then I started feeling a little sheepish. I'm promising without performing. And we have a ethos in our company that when you promise something to your guests, you either complete that task or go back and tell that person why you cannot do it and make it up in some way or the other. But uh, this particular task of engaging with people outside my uh, periphery was a kind of a new challenge for me, for which I had no uh, ideas. And I didn't even know the spelling of environment those days. So I asked my head of HOD in the morning meeting that, look, uh, you guys have been here for a longer time. Uh, this is the feedback that we are getting from the stakeholder, very valid feedback. 
and uh, what should we do? So they all nodded their head and said, yes, we must do something, but they also didn't have any idea. So then after about two and a uh, uh, half months, it occurred to me, why don't I appeal to the good sense of the tourists and put a small sticker on the pack lunch box, please do not litter the island, please bring it back to the hotel for disposal. And we also uh, embedded the message uh, highlighted by the conservator of forests and leave the corals for the fish. And 50% uh, of our tourists brought it back, 50% didn't bring it back. We were not happy with 50% compliance. So then I suggested to my FNV manager that, look, why don't we shift from cardboard packaging box to steel different box? And when we did that, we got into zero waste. And we did not know those days that in a very nano fashion, we started Swachh Bharat Abhyan. And then we got into, you know, a mode which is called Eco Design today and it's also called Six Sigma, where we analyze the use of all resources very minutely in every department. And uh, we went after paper in every department and converted it into uh, rough pads, et cetera, and eliminated the chef's cap into cloth cap. And uh, very quickly we realized, uh, being the smallest hotel, either you enhance your revenue, which we couldn't, or you reduce your costs. So when we shifted from the cardboard pack lunch box to steel tiffin box, uh, we saved about 90 rupees per day. And the steel tiffin box costed us only about uh, uh, 20 rupees. So 90 rupees because every day 15 tourists was going out. We started saving 90 rupees and that was very exciting. And we said, hey, this is very good ROI, ROI return on imagination. And like this, we eliminated a lot of paper in the hotel and we connected with the forest. We said, oh my God, we are bang opposite the tropical forest. We need to protect this very jealously. Otherwise, one day the tourists are not going to come here. Uh, then uh, oh, I was worried that uh, the spent cooking oil was being released in the sea. So I asked my chef, uh, what can we do? We should stop uh, you know, throwing the spent cooking oil in the sea. So he had a brilliant idea. He said, we'll convert it into soap for washing utensils. We did that. And then when I came to mainland, we networked with Indian Railways and we started giving our aggregated uh, used oil to Indian Railways to run a shunter, biodiesel, I'm talking of early 2000. And then I was engaging with regulators and saying that, look, there are so many restaurants throwing away so much of this spent cooking oil, it needs to be aggregated. And I was very happy to see two, three years back that there was a FSSAI truck which was collecting this spent cooking oil from restaurants. And I asked the fellow, what do you do with this oil? He said, we convert it to biodiesel and use it for vehicles. So the small things that you start sometimes becomes big over a period of time when you pursue the idea uh, seriously. <clears throat> then uh, I uh, identified that our hotel was made out of wood. So I asked my chief engineer, how many trees have you cut? And he said, we have cut about maybe 500 trees. So I told him to plant 20,000 trees. We didn't have the space for 20,000 trees in the Andaman Islands because it's 87% forest cover. So I picked up the phone and spoke to the head of AII. And Narsimhan, I said, look, uh, can we plant uh, saplings at our cost and we'll take care of it. I just need your permission. He said, yes. So a week later, we invited the chief secretary and the conservator of forests and we planted 1,500 saplings. But we knew that what we were doing was a very nano scale work, but it was a symbolic gesture. So in order to scale up the idea, we put up this huge hoarding in the airport, planting trees with every individual and organization's responsibility. And then in 2005, I was very happy to see that the United Nations started reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, same principle as we thought of on a scale. Uh, now, uh, uh, having been close to the forest, uh, I was concerned with how uh, forests are being decimated at a, a horrendous rate of about one and a half acres per second on a global scale. And that leads to soil erosion and reducing in rainfall, et cetera, which we are experiencing, experiencing on a grand scale today. I need not tell you because you watch it on TV and your WhatsApp messages every day. And uh, there's a linkage between forest and water. And on first of 31st of March, 1990, I got a letter from the local government saying that from tomorrow, your water supply is going to be cut from 10,000 liters per day to 2,000 liters per day. So when I read this note, I saw stars in the bright sun, sunny day. So 
So I asked my engineer to come to my office and I asked, told him that, look, please do not provide water to Dr. Saxena. I'll be staying in the hotel. And he said, what, sir? I said, you heard me right. Don't supply water to Dr. Saxena in the room. And what will you do? I said, we will leave a note in the room asking Dr. Saxena to uh, ask us for water in the morning. So when Dr. Saxena asks for water in the morning, we'll ask him, why do you want water? Insult, adding insult to injury. So Dr. Saxena will say for brushing his teeth and we'll say, okay. We we'll send you a bucket of fresh water, and if it's for a toilet, we send you sea water. So we did segregation of the water supply, and then intuitively we learned that how painful it was to uh, cart thirty buckets of water to the room uh, during those days. So we learned about water in excess, and that's a subject by itself. Uh, we'll attach that on some other day. And then we took some very vicious decision to continue to run the hotel. We told our staff, you cannot have a bath in the locker room. We stopped supplying water in the room. We told our cooks not to wash the vessels uh, first round with uh, fresh water, but with sea water and final rinse, well, uh, rinse with uh, fresh water for obvious reasons. Then our garden became like hard as it. So I told my chief engineer to dig a well. He was horrified because he said, boss, we'll get sea water. We are on the coast. I said, no, we are on hill slope. You dig a well at six stories high and go up to third stories high and you're still two stories above sea level. And we harvested two lakh liters of water and used that water for our garden. And our problem was still not solved. And you might be wondering, why did we have this problem? In uh, Port Blair, we have two monsoons, northeast and uh, southwest. In 1989, the northeast monsoon failed. Therefore, the dam did not fail, uh, fill up. And therefore, the local administration had to uh, ration water, and rightly so. And therefore, they cut everybody's water. And therefore, we had to. And in those islands, there's no uh, river, there's no lake, and there's no tanker. So you just have to manage yourself completely. So we made a drainage at the edge of the sloping roof and we harvested water. And by doing all this, we reduced our reliance by 80%. But uh, this uh, so-called Cape Town experience in 1990 gave me sleepless nights. And uh, then I wrote a letter to the chief secretary that this has happened this year because of this reason, likely to happen in the future also. Therefore, please make water harvesting mandatory. And he agreed, and the idea was uh, posted in the newspaper, but the idea took about 17 years to implement. It was implemented in 2007. And even today, I get sleepless nights on waterfront because water is going to be a limiting factor for business. And I'm talking from experience. If I had a sixth room booking, if I, want, uh, if I got a booking for a seventh room, my chief engineer should run to the tank and say, no boss, you cannot take this booking. So, and that is playing out with many companies in Rajasthan, Kerala, in various parts of the country, we are aware of that. Uh, we found that you know, our guests used to leave the AC and lights and all open uh, uh, on in the room. So we said we must engage with our uh, guests in our journey in sustainability. And we put up these messages in all the rooms and that helped us to conserve power. But those days we did not know about climate change. And climate change, in climate change domain, people use words like resilience, adaptation, mitigation. And I learned this uh, words intuitively, not in the form which is being stated, through my sister. I was studying in hot summer in Jamshedpur when I was third or fourth standard, and she comes to the room and gives me a slap and puts out the fan. I said, why you slap me? He said, you should learn to study without the fan. So elder sister saying something, there must be some merit in it. I carried that habit over the years, even when I was in Gurgaon for 20 years, in the height of summer, I would sit without fan to build up my own resilience. And I think this is very important today. And last night I was amused that the German government is talking about austerity. Similarly, some other country, Hungary, is also talking about austerity. So austerity has to become our so-called A drive. We have uh, C drive and D drive in uh, computers. We, A drive has to become part of our mental CD-ROM. Then uh, we had a soil erosion problem on the hill slopes. So I naively told my chief engineer to blast it with uh, brick and mortar. And he said, no, you'll be upsetting the uh, architect who designed this hotel so lovingly to bring people as close to nature uh, as possible. And we should uh, not put uh, cement and mortar there. And so I said, what do we do? Because we don't handle this problem. One day our hotel will be in the sea. So he scratched his head, he had uh, no answers. But then I noticed that in the islands, there was a lot of coconut being uh, consumed. 
tender coconut, but not being processed. I said, look, why don't you pick up one truckload of this uh, uh, coconut and anchor it in the areas where we have the soil erosion. And we solved the soil erosion problem. And I did not know the word biomimicry those days. And I did not uh, have the vocabulary of dematerialization construction space. Now, this is an oxymoron. So today, I deal with a lot of construction industry. I'm saying that, look, you guys are wasting a lot of you know, brick and mortar. And as per TIFAC, uh, close to about 40 to 60 kgs of construction debris is created per square meter. So uh, there are great opportunities over there also, but that's for another day. Uh, these are some more pictures of the uh, coconut husk been used for stemming the point. Now, my story is extremely long and uh, and it's impossible to kind of cover it in one day. And uh, it's like sucking a football through a 50 feet hose pipe, you know. But uh, the work we did, uh, we had an energy problem there. In Port Blair, the energy comes from imported diesel oil. They were huge DG sets, which would operate and uh, supply power to the uh, local establishments. And we used to have uh, a lot of power cuts. And uh, those days, uh, since the hotel was not doing well because of uh, the uh, reasons I cited earlier, there were only two flights a week. We didn't have a generator. And we used to light a candle those days. And when we used to light the candle, I used to be very uh, alert. Ki, I hope the bar comes quickly and then people put off the candle in the room so that there's no fire. And uh, uh, then I asked my engineer, hey, why don't we go for wind energy? So then we did some work on wind energy and we found that for wind energy, you need a, you know, a gradual speed of about 35 kmph. And in Port Blair, the wind speeds are above 35 kmph, and uh, you need X number of days for wind power to be uh, uh, properly usable. So we knocked off that, and then we looked at solar, but those days solar uh, technology was terribly expensive, and the technology was not mature. So we just uh, flirted with the technology, and I did nothing on that front. But when I came to mainland, uh, I had the opportunity of working in another division called the Travel House. And I thought I had come to the Mecca of the country where there'll be no power cuts, but I was surprised that from 10 to 3, people were not working. They had computers, but no work was being done. So I suggested to my uh, seniors that we should go for solar hybrid system. And they agreed. And we were the first uh, building in the country to have a a nearly 36 kilowatt uh, system for running our electrical operations during the daytime. And thereafter, I got the opportunity of uh, uh, working in CII for one year. My company was very kind to let me go for one year. And I had some very interesting interactions with regulators, with uh, industry people, and with farmers, etc. I got an opportunity to travel widely and uh, suggested certain ideas which were a little unconventional those days, but they are now being implemented. And uh, one of the things that I realized when I was doing all this was that there's no point in me knowing all this and my heads of department knowing all this. It was very important for uh, the staff to understand the uh, natural capital of the place. Mm -hmm. Uh, prior to my arrival, my staff would, you know, kind of uh, wash the broken corals. The guests used to break the corals and they'd wash, they used to wash it for them. Or the guests would tell them, break for me and they'll happily break for them. So when I realized the importance of corals, which is the nursery for the small fish, uh, I told my staff by training all of them that, look, uh, if we keep on breaking corals, then you are destroying the natural capital of the place and then the tourists are not going to come. So if you are taking Dr. Damija on a picnic and she asks you to break, you politely tell her, no, madam, I'll not break for you. So they were horrified to learn, to hear from me that I was telling them not to tell to the guests because, you know, in our business, we treat the guests as a god. So then I said, okay, if you're worried about telling the guests, you take my name and tell them that uh, my GM has told me to... Uh, tell you to please don't break the corals and tell them the reason why you're doing it. 
that this is a home for the young fingerlings and those fish are eaten by the larger fish and it's part of the ecosystem. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you'll be happy to know I did not get a single complaint. Our guests were very happy with this kind of insight given by our staff. So the point that I'm trying to make is that uh, the subject has become so complex and big today. The subject needs to be uh, cascaded in a very seamless manner using technology. For instance, uh, some time back, I was talking to a group where there was a person from Airtel. And uh, this was a very intensive program because uh, I broke it down to about six sessions and each session was for one and a half hours. And I told them that, look, since you belong to a particular company, which is in the cell phone space, you should suggest to your boss that once in 15 days, beam messages, cogent messages, not save trees and save water, how to do that. There are innumerable ideas of how you can save water from a very small manner to a very big manner. And the a common example I always give to people is that start offering small peg and large peg of water, so 50 ml of water or 100 ml of water. And this brings humor in the uh, audience uh, minds. But I then tell them that, look, uh, after you finish laughing, do the maths. If you look at our country, there will be 25 crore homes. And in each home, we waste at least one liter of water because we don't consume all the water that we put in the glass. And 25 crore liters of precious water being thrown down the drain, and we call ourselves a water stress country. And in the 25 crores, I have not included the washing, the water required for washing. Similarly, when I interact with my own friends in the hotel industry, I said, look, we need to have this practice on a collective basis and set a new benchmark for the rest of the world. Why should we always get the practices from OECD countries or elsewhere? Sustainability is part of our culture for thousands of years. I learned from late uh, Dalip Biswas, the chairman of CPCV. He said, the Vedas said that thou shalt not put even a rose petal in the river. Today, let's look at the river and see how we are treating our rivers. So it's very important to internalize what we are doing to nature and change our respective habits. I'm very happy to hear when uh, Prime Minister went for the, the COP26 meeting, he used the word life, lifestyle for change. Each individual has to change. And I think it cannot, it's a task which cannot be just be done by the government or industry. Everybody has to be involved. And uh, some of the chains have picked up the idea of uh, offering uh, small, so-called small peg and large peg. And I'm deliberately using this because in our industry, in the bar, when you go to a bar, people order for a small peg or large peg because then you're capturing the scarcity value of resources. Through this humor, you can take the subject to a deeper level into geography, cul culture, maths, physics, science, quality, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then I, I recall, uh, I made a SWOT analysis for the islands in 1989. Uh, in the SWOT analysis, I pointed out in the threat section that the Great Nicobar Islands, which is in the utmost southern part of the Andaman Island, is about 90 kilometers away from the Indonesian shores. And that's also called the Strait of Malacca. And those days, 600 ships used to crisscross every day there. I said, look, uh, someday there's going to be an oil spill, and therefore we should place oil uh, spill combat equipment in Port Blair so that in case of this uh, exigency, we are able to control the oil spill. The, again, the administration liked the idea, but the idea was not implemented. Way back in 1993, I was not in Port Blair. I left uh, for Delhi, and there was an oil spill there. The size of the oil spill was about 20,000 tons. They flew down the equipment from Bombay, but the equipment was not good enough to fight the 20,000 tons of oil spill. Uh, fortunately for us, uh, the wind conditions carried it away from the uh, Great Nicobar shores. But nothing to be happy, maybe it carried it to the Indonesian shores. So somewhere we had destroyed the natural resource because of the oil spills. And today, technologies have been developed to use the human hair for lassoing the oil spill. So a lot of work is being done and uh, we need to be conscious of how we can handle these issues more proactively. Uh, whilst in Port Blair, 
we also got into social domain and i'll be uh, talking about that briefly uh, because we were so called five star hotel people used to come to seek our help but our revenues would not allow us to do that so symbolically we help one uh, orphanage with you know uh, erasers and pencils and notebooks every month but then when we went to see my engineer and i we went to see the place i was horrified to see the condition the plumbing was bad electrical work was bad carpentry was bad so in hotels as you know we have skilled carpenters electricians and plumbers so i told my engineer send these guys and you know upgrade that and we did that and then uh, being a general manager of hotel you know you know who is who of the city so when somebody asked me for a tv for their training program i would just pick up the phone and speak to my rich friend and say ki hey these guys are doing good work can you please give them a tv and they readily did that similarly those days there was only one airline indian airlines and when people came from flight from chennai to port blair some of the people would not eat the bun or the butter chiplet and that was being thrown away so i spoke to the station manager i said look why are you throwing this precious food why don't you give it to uh, the orphanage and they started doing that the point that i'm trying to make is that without knowing the nuances of sustainability we interconnected with a whole lot of issues and the subject is today called uh, eco design and we save 10% on our uh, uh, turnover without any consultants and even if the consultants were there they were not there those days we wouldn't have been able to afford them and then i was very happy when i read the uh, 17 indicators of uh, the un sdg in 2015 uh, which were articulated in the paris accord and i kind of compared it to the work that we had done and we found that we had conformed to all the 17 indicators so what were the insights and self learnings our goodwill was announced with the government officials they liked the way we were doing and engaging and sharing not only with them from the policy front but we're sharing with the competition also because i used to tell my team we must be very clear in our mind what is competitive information and what is collaborative information and the analogy that i used to use for them those days was that we are in a leaking ship and if uh, dr demija and i we are in the ship if you are enemies we better work together if you want to survive we learned the principles of, of waste management we converted to circular economy all our red garbage went into our garden we converted to manure the spent cooking oil was converted into uh, soap as i mentioned to you earlier and uh, we did not know that we kind of started extended producer responsibility and took responsibility for our uh, so called externalities by repurposing our waste and we learned the tools of six sigma and eco design and you migrated from a linear to a circular economy in a small hotel and again uh, i don't have any background on policy etc but all our learnings we convert to kind of a letters of request to the administration to convert the policy data so that the work can be done on scale now uh, the accounting language is replete with very beautiful terminology the going concern principle the principle of prudence the principle of consistency the precautionary principle etc but i'm going to play primarily on the principle of prudence and the precautionary principles are we prudent in overusing our resources in various industries can the car industry in their manual also mention uh, gentlemen ladies please don't use a hose while washing your car you can do the same with a wet cloth so bring down the consumption of water from 600 liters to maybe about 1 liter for washing the car right and similarly where is the principle of prudence a country like india which is hot and we have all these glass clad buildings in gurgaon we first heat the building and then we put large generators to cool it and whenever i used to visit these uh, large offices i used to wear a coat and women used to come in a uh, stole or a light sweater etc so there's a kind of a paradox that we say we don't have energy 
and yet we waste energy and that also imported energy and then we spend 85,000 crores on importing oil from other countries. And this precautionary principle has to be again applied in many aspects of business and these words have to become a little mainstreamed uh, with regards to resources. Yes, the financial resources, all these principles are applied and used very beautifully. Look at whenever there's a crisis, organization will cut all their costs, you know, and shave it. Considering that we are in a finite world and this world at least now is being used, how do we change our processes and products so that we don't overuse our resources? And the word environmental externality, as you might be aware, is basically that if I'm driving a car, I don't take responsibility for my emission. So how do we ensure that different industries have their externalities or how that can be internalized? But this is not part of the financial architecture as, architecture as yet. And if I remember right, in 2012, I read a book where I read a figure which clicks to my mind. A global externality was about $3 trillion. To my mind, the external, externality must have gone up to about $12 trillion today. What a waste of resources and uh, money. So from 2014 onwards, after exiting from the system, I continued with my work and I've been uh, following up on these kind of policies, which have yet to see the light of the day. Uh, I was talking in Gandhi Nagar to about 100 mayor and I was telling them, why don't you articulate a policy that there'll be no landfill site in 10 years time so that the industry start applying their mind and reduce the uh, waste that they're generating. And when they know that the policy will be stiff and tough, then they will start unleashing their creative juices. Then it's very important that we also look at the carrying capacity of the city. To my mind, most of the cities have exceeded their carrying capacity. So we have to look at different ways of uh, demarketing the cities. Then uh, in 2004, as part of the National Water Committee, in the first meeting, I told the Secretary of Water, why don't we start Bureau of Water Efficiency as akin to Bureau of Energy Efficiency? In 2014, I read a report by Ministry of Power that the country has saved 86,146 crores worth of energy because of BEE. I think similar opportunities are lurking in the area of water also. I'm happy there is a Jal Shakti Abhyan ministry, but when you have a Bureau of Water Efficiency, every stakeholder will have to articulate how much water they're using, what they're doing to reduce their water footprint. And this has to be featured in the annual report as with uh, power, which is being done now. And considering that uh, climate change has already entered uh, our uh, uh, sitting room, we need to have a plan which is uh, implemented on a scale. We have so many rooftops which are uh, just cement. Why can't we have broken white tiles to deflect the uh, heat back into the atmosphere or encourage rooftop gardens or have solar uh, panels out there? Under that, we can have uh, some kind of plants grown over there so that A, you enhance your, uh, reduce your carbon. Uh, carbon miles for the food and also cool the city because so many buildings create a heat island effect. One building heats the other. And what is worrisome is that one of the conferences I heard recently that by 2030, India's need for air conditioning alone will be 175 gigawatt. Where is this 175 gigawatt coming from? So we have to completely change our uh, uh, mental architecture and practices to ensure that we make our buildings uh, more eco-responsible. I'm not using the word eco-friendly because the, none of our activities are eco-friendly. Uh, we live in a country where there is India and Bharat. I've been talking about India for a long time. It's important to shift our focus now to Bharat, that is rural India. So in 2016, I was invited to speak to uh, some hearing and speech impaired boys and girls in Kopal district in uh, Karnataka. And I saw a lot of malnutrition there. So I told this uh, NGO that, look, you have a three acres uh, greenhouse. Why don't you start Bank of Nutrition? He said, what do you mean by that? I said, look, government of India cannot do everything. We must teach resilience to people or Atmanirva, which is the word which is being constantly used today. 
And why don't we give these uh, people five kinds of plants to plant behind their homes? So go up, papaya, lemon, moringa, uh, amla, and banana. The list is not cast in stone. It will vary depending on the five agro-geographical conditions in the country. So he started it and it moved to about five core villages and there's a uh, complete stop. In 2000, I found a good NGO. I'm working with Narsayog Foundation. And uh, he has rolled it out in about 100 villages. Now, this is also a nano drop. But once people see the benefit of this and how it raises the nutrition profile and also prevents children from birth being born with disabilities, it's a proactive strategy. And the collateral benefits of these trees being planted is that you are cooling the villages and the birds and the bees come back and they help you to enhance your yield from your neighboring farms. So, and this uh, movement of Bank of Nutrition is being rolled out through children whom this NGO teaches. The idea is that if you give experiential learning to children at young age, you're giving them life skills. They should not be just looking for jobs in the city. They should be looking at the opportunities which exist in soil management, in enhancing yield of various products, in creating, uh, in producing value-added products. Like if they have a huge number of these Moringa uh, plants, then the leaves can be used for uh, selling in the urban market. I recall that uh, I purchased this Moringa powder very hygienically packed. I paid 300 rupees for a 250 grams. So look at ideas which will help them to uh, bring more money in their pocket and move them from the distress they face every year. So these are some pictures of the children who planted this and now they are they're standing next to the Moringa plant and the papaya plant and enjoying the fruit of what they did. And then uh, soil erosion is a problem. So again, a humble initiative has been made uh, this year in uh, Karu district in Tamil Nadu, where on the banks of the uh, Czech Dam, wetiver grass is being planted because wetiver grass helps to uh, prevent soil erosion. Uh, it is good fodder. It has aromatic qualities and uh, it absorbs CO2. It has multiple attributes. It needs to be done on a great, great scale. Then, uh, just in the month of May, uh, this NGO, Narsayo Foundation, he nudged the local marginalized farmers. And for the benefit of those who do not know what's a marginalized farmer, he or she owns one, one and a half acres of land. They're really poor farmers. And uh, this uh, pond that you see uh, has been, again, done in Tumkur district where they take care of children's education also. So he's leveraging on the goodwill that he has uh, created in these villages to take the regenerative process of economy in a very uh, humble way. So when he started, uh, people were kind of sniggering ki ye kya ho ra and all that. And fortunately, there was unseasonal rain in this water stress region. And this pond filled up. Today, another 40 farmers want to do the same thing in their area. And the 40 will become 80 and 80 will become 100. And please remember, this is self-financed. The farm is willing to put 25% and 75% comes to donation. But uh, these are the kind of creative frameworks we need to create to bring about scales so that government is not burdened with a whole lot of uh, such uh, initiatives. So... The story that I have is that from an acorn, oak tree grows. The story is very long. And uh, I would also like to end by saying that uh, education, uh, experience is a, a great teacher. It gives you the test first and the lessons on. So this is what, uh, this is the kind of lessons and the test that I uh, derived in Port Blair. Uh, so thank you very much. And I'm now open to question and answers. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Khatri. A very elaborate journey you have told us. And the points you put up for those eco-design, I think they are the points which are coming up again and again, as you said, in the form of SDGs, in the form of other points. 
So I really like that compilation. You know, even you did not leave out that we have lack of skilled staff. That is what I feel that was there. I remember, you know, when I had gone to Goa, Hayat Regency people had contacted me. They wanted to set up a biogas plant. Mother, what I'm trying to say, the hotel people or the hospitality sector I have found has been very willing to come forward and adopt better measures so that they can improve their waste management, they can look up for more sources of energy. So they wanted to use the coconut coir for setting up a biogas plant. They were already using the steam from, uh, they, have, they had a solar plant from where they were getting the electricity and some steam generation also they were doing, which they were doing for their ironing and all that, laundry. So, and I think we, you must be knowing in most of the, um, you know, hotels, we have those big Arun uh, dishes, solar dishes, where we can cook food and we can, you know, is there. So the initiatives which you have taken long way back, I think they are now flowering, you know, they are coming forward and people are now getting more and more conscious. So I, I, I just wanted to ask you that when you said that lack of skilled staff, now we have the sector skill council here that is for green jobs but we have for the hospitality sector also so now is the hotels or the hospitality sector tying up with those councils and uh, uh, getting them skilled or is it still that it is on a off and on basis are you aware uh, frankly speaking i have no connection with the hospitality councils and what is happening over there okay okay, okay. Yeah. any questions dr saxena yeah, in very much, uh, uh, Khatri Saab, it has been such a pleasure. Uh, while I have heard these uh, um, stories uh, in bits and pieces from you many, many times uh, when we used to discuss individual aspect, the only comment I, I say that you are the true example of necessity is mother of invention. In fact, all what you did because it was so so much required uh, when you were you were in Port Blair and that that is actually truly translating into uh, real ex experiences and maybe a path unknowingly discovering a path uh, uh, which has now sustainable development goals mm -hmm. so once again thank you very much and uh, we I personally have learned a lot uh, not only from this lecture but from uh, from the discussions we had and the time we were spending together in rainwater harvesting for India International Center uh, and things like that. So once again, thank you very much. And we would definitely uh, like to inculcate these habits or rather we are uh, in our personal life also. Thank you very much once again. Thank you. Uh, one small question I have, you have, uh, you know, you said 1200 schools in Delhi had adopted that eco-designing. So what sort of uh, parameters or what sort of uh, this thing they had adopted? The eco oh, very good question. Very good okay. question. Uh, when I moved to mainland, I found that uh, I, when I moved to Delhi, I was uh, horrified because in Port Blair, I was used to visibility of 25 kilometers from my hotel. And when I came to Delhi, my um, uh, visibility was only four kilometers. Hmm. So... And uh, the task is very large. It cannot be done by any individuals. Mm -hmm. So in 94, I made a humble beginning by uh, conducting training for uh, school teachers. I realized that I cannot reach out to the children, but mm -hmm. if I reach out to the teachers and teach them the eco-designing methodology, each teacher will teach about 50, 60 kids. Mm -hmm. And the kids will then go and tell in their house, Papa, while shaving, why are you running the tap? Why don't you use half a mug of water? And Papa will be very, very embarrassed that the kid is saying something very correct. And uh, this is called the Trojan horse strategy. Share best practices to the children without confrontation. Because if I come to your house and tell you to do this, do that, you'll tell me, go fly a kite, right? But if you use a different methodology, a creative methodology of doing things, then you can bring about disruption. So uh, to answer your question, yeah. uh, the rating had 51 points asking the school, he, uh, what's the size of your school? How much acreage you got? How many kind of trees you got? How many kind of children have you got? Are you rainwater harvesting? Are you harvesting energy, et cetera, et cetera. 
And the last question is that, okay, madam, if you have done all this, please influence another five friends of yours in other schools have not done it. Again, hub and spoke concept. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> through this process, uh, I recall uh, MOEF um, uh, mandated that all uh, schools must have uh, eco clubs. How yes. effectively they're working, I don't no, know. No, no. Uh, yeah. I'm I just I sorry know. for the intervention. I was in Delhi government and okay. eco club was a very strong point. There were so many eco clubs all over the state. So if, I, if it had started up as a point of uh, discussion in your uh, this thing, so I should inform you that eco clubs were the strength of the Department of Environment. You know, children were very well connected and more so rainwater harvesting that has become mandatory in all the schools. There is a heavy uh, you know, fine of five lakhs a school has to pay if they don't have the rainwater. And we are in touch with many boys, with many people who are doing this rainwater harvesting there. So I would, and then also one more concept you had said about putting solar. So there, you know, when uh, the, I, I should not name any political person, but when I was in Delhi government, I was told either you have a black roof, that means you have a panel or you have a white roof, you know, have tiles. So that is how we would like to cool our, our city. You know, this sort of a concept was there. So whatever points you have raised, Katri Saab, they have really been taken forward and they have really been, you know, adopted, I should say, in Delhi government. I think Karnataka also has a good uh, history. They're also doing well and other states also. But in Delhi, this has come forward and it has come out very well. Yeah. yeah. I, since, I you, think... since you touched about water and rainwater harvesting, yeah. water harvesting is a very small component of water management. Yes. Because as you know, that we get three months of monsoon and in three months we get 100 hours of rain. And in that 100 hours of rain, we get 10 hours of very intense uh, quantity of rain. Mm -hmm. And uh, no country is able to harvest all the water which is falling, right? And therefore, the laws are in place, but somehow the laws are not being followed properly. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying this because um, I interact with a lot of RWAs. They have implemented rainwater housing 20 years back, but they've not desilted for 20 years. Okay. Right. Okay. So then I tell them that look, if you buy a car, you send your car for servicing, the same thing required for this thing also. Right. Mm. So then it was done in one particular place, and we are harvesting 7 million liters of water uh, per annum now because of the desilting alone. Mm. So the other thing that I'd like to also mention is that the understanding in environment has four phases. First is a denial phase, then is a dispersal phase, and then is acceptance and creativity. Uh, I didn't have the luxury of getting into denial and dispersal phase. We got into accepting and we got into creativity phase. And I've given you enough examples of that. Yes. And uh, we have a Swachh Bharat Abhyan, but a lot more work to be needs to be done there because... Uh, with great difficulty, people are segregating uh, wet waste and dry waste. Actually, there should be another six, seven segregation has to be there for, uh, you know, sanitary napkins and various all other things and batteries and e-waste and all. We need some systematic systems in place. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done there. Yes. And if we have this policy of no landfill site, we will free up 1,546 square kilometers of landfill site occupied in uh, the edge of every city. Nature works so efficiently that they don't have any waste. Everything is kind of uh, produced, consumed, and decomposed. But we human beings, we have great producers, great consumers, but we are very poor in decomposition. Mm -hmm. And the decomposition has to begin at home, so in a small way. Yes. So waste is a separate subject, but I'm just giving you a yeah. conceptual understanding of the yeah. whole subject. It has to start from self. You know, sustainability has to start from self. Everybody has to contribute. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. There is one question from Nita Ganguly. She's saying that she was also running an eco club school and she wants to you to share the story of some differently able people who worked for ITC and their commitment towards the job. Oh, okay. That's part of our social dimension. We started this initiative in 2005. And here again, uh, our knowledge was absolutely zero in the subject. So mm -hmm. I traveled intensively across the country, first understanding the subject from NGOs. And then I found that people were taking a sympathetic approach to people with disabilities. Mm 
So I told my HR managers, no sympathy for people with disabilities. Empathy, because when you empathize, you do the right things. When you sympathize, you shed crocodile tears. And being in the business that we are in, I'll, we will not be forgiven if a disabled person uh, doesn't give us service properly. So we said, we must identify jobs which he or she can do. Mm. I remember the first case, we uh, appointed a girl with cerebral palsy and we put her in the back of the house in the housekeeping department where she had to dish out clean u- uniform to staff. So as you know, in uh, cerebral palsy, you have an intelligent mind, but a, but a disobedient body, your hands shake, they don't coordinate well with the where it, the hand should go. So she used to handle this uh, housekeeping uh, uniform room and uh, we wanted our internal customers to be happy. So after a month, I asked them, are your staff happy with her work? And they said, yes, they're very happy with her work. So that gave us a little confidence. And then we, uh, I moved to Delhi. We took a girl who's mobility impaired. And she comes on a wheelchair. She can talk like you and me. And uh, in hotels, there's a lot of attrition rate. And we wanted a person in the telephone department because that department had a lot of attrition rate. So uh, we took her, but then we did a reality check. We found that she had to negotiate 15 steps. So it was not feasible. Therefore, the chief engineer said, look, I need a person in the engineering control room. Every hotel has an engineering control room. So she was handling that. And uh, if I'm not wrong, she's still working there. She joined in 2005. She got better job than better salary than what we were giving that time, but she stuck on and now she's become the chief engineering secretary. Similarly, we took a hearing and speech impaired boy in our hotel in Bangalore. Uh, he works in reservations. So now you'll be wondering what's a hearing and speech impaired boy doing in the reservation. We had uh, three girls busy taking reservation, but they were not loading it on the computer. So this guy, he was computer literate. So the girls would give the reservations to him, he'll load it. And at six o'clock, he will tell the front office manager that, look, you can overbook by minus 10 or minus five, et cetera. And he helped us to announce the revenues through this particular route. So basically we said, okay, if somebody is hearing and speech impaired, which are the safe jobs he or she can do? So we put them in the engineering control room, in the reservations. Then we taught the boys how to change bulbs. They used to change bulbs. Hmm. Then we also got in touch with our supply chain because we cannot sub- give jobs to everyone. So if uh, somebody is my supplier, I'm telling that, look, this is what we have done. This is how we have done. We are going to train, train them to uh, paint and all that. You do a lot of painting work for us, employ them. Then we again announced our circle of influence by reaching out to the uh, BPO sector. Now, BPO sector, as you know, uh, works 24 hours and they have huge canteens where staff come and uh, consume whatever they have to. So I requested 11 of them, can you give me six feet by six feet square, uh, square feet space in your uh, canteen uh, without charging a uh, rental so that these boys can start their own small kiosk selling biscuit, chips, etc., etc. They agreed. We arranged free uh, furniture for them, but they had to put five or six thousand rupees from their pocket. And uh, I recall we put one guy in Tata Teleservice. In his, his initial daily sale was 500. Now he's doing about 5,000 rupees per day. So there are many such stories. And then we realized that what we are doing is again a nano drop. So we disrupted the system because the existing CR is like, CSR is like giving loose chain. We said, no, bring about systemic chain. So we wrote two books on the subject, how to employ people with disabilities, 12 page book six pages of picture and six pages of write-up because people don't have the appetite to read. And other industries could infer from that how to employ people with disabilities. And very important that is your infrastructure barrier free. So we wrote a book on universal design on this subject. And both these books are available on the website of ITC and ITC Hotel even today. And they're heavily downloaded. So the story is very long. We can have a separate session for this. Yeah, I, 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 I appreciate, you know, the, when you encourage, I had a class fellow who was having afflicted with polio and he, he never used to allow us. He used to, we never had lifts in our university. So he used to never say, tell us, okay, you help me in climbing the stones, stairs. He used to do it himself. And uh, Mr. Khatri, he rose to be a leading enologist in the, in, 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 in winemaking, in microbiology. He's written books. 
he became a professor in Solon University, the way he rose, the spirit he had. So a little encouragement and let them do what they want and how can they, they can do, you just facilitate. I have a compliment from Ms. Dr. Anil Kumar, if you remember from Department of Environment. Oh, yes, I remember I also with him. Yeah. yeah. So he's sending you your, his compliments and he says that... He has Namaskar, Khatri ji. Yeah, yeah. Namaskar, Namaskar, Doctor. <laughs> Namaskar. Uh, I, I think my video is not, uh, I can't uh, do that. So, so uh, after a long time, I'm really, uh, I'm happy to uh, at least, uh, uh, you working the uh, area when the sustainability is not very popular word, that's you working in the, that was the, now everybody is talking about sustainability, but you're working so long in this area. Thank you, Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Doctor, tell us a little bit about eco-clubs. He was worried. I told him they were doing very well, eco-clubs. But, but not now is the, because we all left. Dr. Sabat and myself, Dwarkanath, uh -huh. everybody retired now. I have taken BRS also. And Dr. Sabat retired, Dwarkanath has taken BRS. So now is not as good in the department, eco-clubs, as where it was used to be. Anita Gamli, Madam, was there. Everybody so I mean, this was the enthusiasm was there at that time. Khatriji was working at it. But that is why the subject needs to be mainstreamed in schools. It's yes. still not mainstreamed. Uh, Khatri yeah. sahab, that brings me to, I was about to say that, in fact, we are uh, uh, we are introducing rainwater harvesting in the as a vocational education in schools. Uh, so, uh, in fact, I would need uh, maybe some help from you or maybe vetting of the content we are trying to prepare. Uh, that would be typically for schools. I was thinking that it could be divided into two parts. One, um, uh, normal houses uh, adopting uh, rainwater harvesting, uh, something goes to the schools and maybe for, for uh, uh, industry and other places, uh, uh, maybe a little bigger uh, with, with uh, storage tank and things like that. So I will come back to you on that. We are already uh, in the process of preparing a video uh, for, for this. So... Uh, we will try to contact you to, uh, to get some, some piece of information if you will have. be happy to yeah. give my inputs. Yeah. Once again, thank you very much. Uh, thank Dr. You. Uh, formally, thanks, Kardije. Ah, Dr. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mr. Khatri, for giving us your valuable time thank you. and accepting our request to come and be a part of us in this series. And your contribution is well recognized. And we will ask you for more. Uh, he, he, there's another question from Nita Ganguly in the line of physics, chemistry and bio lab. I used to run an EVS lab also. So I think Ms. Dr. Anil Kumar also recognized her that she had an eco club and an EVS lab, environmental lab. Okay. So once again, Can I just add much. one thing? It was... Yes, please, uh, it was, please, please, please. It please, was please. Uh, Mr. Niranjan Khatri. He is my mentor. So he was the first one who taught me how to run this lab, run this club without using any paper. So uh, he said, he, he gave me a condition. I, I invited him for a, uh, for a, you know, a, a seminar. He said, I will only come if you can invite me without sending me a single piece of paper. So I had to learn how to use a computer and then only he agreed to. So he's been uh -huh. a, a great force yeah. for my, for what I am today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Nita. Thank you. Thank you once again. And I think we can close one again um, of this thing with a big thanks again. Yeah. Thank you nice very day. much, Khatri Sahab. Thanks yeah. a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Khatri Sahab. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, Thank you, Khatri. Thank you. Have a good day, sir. Thank you.